but then there was an attempt to legitimize the use of technology um, in our elections. That's the reason we saw the uh, bimodal voter accreditation system, BVAS, then we had the IREV and so on. Um, also, when you look at the fact that that same act that was amended made provision for the autonomy of INEC in a sense, you know, it created the INEC fund and then it, it uh, ensured that um, INEC would pr be provided for at least 360 days before the election. Meaning that once you have your money to be able to plan and prepare, then the outcome should be better. But all I have to say now, after all said and done, and the high expectation is that hopes were shattered. Um, and it's a shame. This is an election that the um, election management body, INEC, um, eventually budgeted over 300, uh, 300 and 300, over 300 billion naira for, and they got that money. And then we are wondering, okay, so what we saw is that the summary of how the money was spent, it, it was a sham of an election, as a matter of fact. And I would not be here also pretending that some people did not cast their ballots peacefully and so on, but you can count the places. And then there were pockets of violence here and there, there was intimidation. More than ever, the Nigerian political class weaponized tribe and religion and poverty in a way that made it really, really disastrous. A lot of people lost their mind. A lot of people lost their lives. They are, you know, it's, it's challenging and it's painful that this is 2023. And we are saying this. The electoral body that's supposed to be an unbiased umpire, you can't say that right now confidently because a lot of things went on. And then there are pockets of evidences here and there saying, oh, this happened, that happened, and so on. But that's for the election. But what I would just say as a Nigerian is that if we continue this way, without having a legitimate process that brings people into office. It's just a matter of time. People will revolt. So what happened in 2023 that made it different from every other election is also the fact that there had been agitations just before 2023. Remember NSARS of 2020, essentially a young people's movement, wherein they were saying, we want a good country. It started with police brutality, as a matter of fact. Oh, we want um, police to just stop being brutal. We don't want extrajudicial killings, all of that. And young people took to the streets. And we know how that was truncated also by the state. So young people were really, really furious. It wasn't just a young people's movement. It was driven by young people. We had elderly people also joining to say, oh, this is what we have always said, and so on. So it was a legitimate people-driven movement. And that movement, because it was truncated, also metamorphosed into what we saw as the 2023 election, because a lot of pent-up anger went into the, into the election. Like, oh, okay, if we can't speak on the street, if you want to allow us to express ourselves on the street, we are going to do that through the ballot. But getting to the ballot and seeing the level of harassment and intimidation, and the fact that eventually it seemed like their votes did not count, Hopes have been dashed. And these are some of the people that are just growing, that are just understanding democratic processes. So what I have to say in conclusion right now is that what we had, to my mind, was not an election. It's, it's shameful. It's painful. Because Nigeria is now a giant. I mean, once you cross over the age of 50, you're no longer a child. And here we are still talking about, in fact, the fact that we are still signing peace accord in 2023 is a shame. It's practically like saying, okay, um, we, in, the, in the view of the world, I'm signing with you, my brother, I'm signing with you, my sister, to say that I won't kill you, you won't kill me, I mean. Do you need anybody to make you sign a pact not to kill each other in a supposed democratic system? So that's on the one side. Then when you look at the um, issue of women inclusion or even participation of women in governance, and I say governance because I think most times we still restrict, um, we, we confuse governance with politics in Nigeria. And I know it's also deliberate. It's a scheme of the political class to confuse people. You know, politics is only a tool, just one of the many tools of governance. But then they reduce everything about governance to politics, such that they weaponize poverty, weaponize tribe, weaponize ethnicity, weaponize religion, everything that, that is supposed to bind us and unite, unite us. The political class always finds a way to weaponize it, and then the people begin to fight themselves, as opposed to fighting the oppressor. So you find the oppressed dividing and fighting themselves while the oppressors are having a few day. So these are some of the challenges. But then talking about how women are fed so far, I think our system has still largely been unfair to women. Largely. You look at 
everything that led into the election and then even the outcome of the elections and then it's very funny because sometimes people will say oh well, then women too should come out just take the space take the space and do but it's not that easy, especially when you're in a cultural society where some things hold you back naturally. And when we were speaking upstairs, I gave some examples about how even traditionally we judge women who are active. We judge women who are conscious, who want to contribute, who want to be part of governance. We give them names and labels. So, for instance, a political party is holding its meeting and a woman is there. Maybe the meeting is lasting two hours, three hours. They begin to ask, oh does she not have children does she not have a home to run so we we sort of um we restrict to women to either this role or that role we don't believe that women can actually have a full life you can be a family woman and be a career woman and someone who participates in the development of your country as a matter of fact but we want women to choose every now and then it's either or which doesn't make development work because you can't keep shortchanging uh, over 50 percent of your population and expecting to have maximum development you can't it won't work so what i just have to say is that um even as political parties as movements as a people we have to continue to shift mindsets to let people realize that development governance is a matter for all it's not an exclusive for some while the others should just stay out. If women can play entertainment roles and sing and dance and share food during your rallies, why can't they be in the room and do other things? So this is also a charge to my fellow women. I know it's not easy because you're in a system that is calculated against you. Socialization, even the way we raise our girls, we tell them, oh, you have to seek validation. You have to sit here. You have to do that. You have to. But we raise boys to be bold, to be confident, to reach for the moon, you know, that kind of thing. So it starts from the way that we raise our children. And then when we see women who aspire, let's encourage them. Let's stop all these stereotypes and labeling. It doesn't make sense because at the end of the day, women will draw back. So a lot of people have said, oh, but we made progress. Now we had a woman who almost became a governor in Adamawa State. And I said almost because even that is ridiculous. When you have an election and you have an electoral empire, I mean, you see a straight line, then suddenly it's a bend. And you're like, okay, when did that happen? And that's what happened. So in Adamawa, it could have been a woman. It wasn't a woman eventually, however that worked. But then now people are saying, oh, we made progress because a state like Quara produced five members of the House of Assembly. We have some. But I mean, if you look at it against the bigger picture, it's still, I mean, it's less than 5%. Even in comparison with some African countries. With other African countries, yeah. where in Rwanda yeah. says, we need to have half-half. You know, and sometimes even more than half. So it's not, it's not, and when we talk about women um, inclusion or participation, it's not a privilege. You're not doing them a favor. It's a right. It's not like, oh, okay. And we're not talking tokenism because we are seeing that a lot now also. Wherein certain appointments are done and then it's okay, bring a woman. Let's just bring a woman so that it doesn't look, mm -mm. So, and, and that's another challenge. The fact that we think when we talk gender, we're just using women to balance the number. No, we're not doing that. Because at the end of the day, we want the best hands as well. We want the best women. We want the best men. But then, let's stop um, making things harder. Either by because of the times that we hold our political meetings or even the judgment that goes with a woman being in politics. There's nothing wrong. Politics is a tool of governance. And you should be proud if your mother, your sister, your wife, any woman in your family is interested and conscious enough to want to be part of things. It's a thing of pride. It's not a thing to judge. Thank you very much.